Hey everybody, welcome back to Human Reaction. <clears throat> God damn it. <clears throat> Don't use that <laughs> Cold <laughs> open. Relax, <Brian. laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> You oh, did do that sorry. a lot. And just a single. What? <laughs> like, yeah. Did yeah, he I do did, that several times? That. He'd, just, he'd, just, that. he'd just be talking, and then he'd just go up and... <laughs> he'd be like, what? Republicans don't like that bill? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Human Reaction, your weekly source for independent commentary on cultural news and politics, where it's always our mission to arm you with the tools you need to cut through media misdirection and resist the mono narrative. I am Joe Sheehan. Today, I am joined by the usual suspects, David Rand and Kyle Mack. How are we doing, guys? Doing pretty good. Doing good. Awesome. Doing good. Can't complain. What are we talking about today? So Joe Biden did a speech and he did not fall over. But it's Donald Trump discovered Snapchat filters, and we have to watch some of those. Uh, SCOTUS uh, says that Trump is allowed on all the ballots, so that happened, and uh, Trump had a great week because Nikki Haley has returned to her cocoon to uh, basically rest for a thousand years and return <laughs> as Morath, the oh. mother of the neocons. Oh, my God. Uh, and <laughs> lastly, uh, it turns out Haiti is a basket case because of the Intel boys, and we got a really interesting story from... The gray zone on that. Yeah. And uh, before we jump into all that, please like, comment, subscribe wherever you are on whichever platform you're, you're watching us on. If you're on YouTube, hit that notification bell. I was looking and it was something like there, there's an absurd number of the amount of people that watch us that are not subscribed. Yeah, it's like 80 plus percent yeah, or it's more. Like crazy. Yeah. And I think that's especially with our guests that we've had recently. So you have a lot of crossover. So hit yeah. that, sub that subscription button. Um, I, and also just looking at all the stats, we're in the green. It's like we're trading Bitcoin over here. We're just going up. Yeah. We're going to the moon right <laughs> to now. To the moon. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yes. So thank you. Thank you, everybody that's uh, that's been supporting us. Uh, we are seeing a lot of growth on this podcast, and we are very happy to see uh, to, that this thing's actually working out for us. Yes. Thank right. you so much. Um, and also join our Discord right now. And we I know we have a lot of new members. <laughs> um, <laughs> Democracy prevails. You guys get this reference, right? Uh, this got to be V for Vendetta, right? Yeah, it's from V for Vendetta. Yeah. They always oh, yeah. say England prevails and the England prevails. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> that's so good. The common good. <laughs> the common good. The that's that's what it is that's right <laughs> we gave bennett stream deck privileges this could prove to be disastrous or it could be awesome or it could be the out. best investment we ever made <laughs> <laughs> well one thing's for sure it's hard for me to engage in a conversation and be on point on the button yeah. so i think that's gonna work out better all I right i think it's your way of silencing me well it's working so far i know now he's talking now what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't ruin it for me <laughs> yikes yikes all right. All right, guys. Uh, well, where are we at? Okay, so I'm picking up where you left off, Kyle. We've got a thousand subscribers on TikTok. That means we can do TikTok lives. We're going to be doing those every week, and we're going to be publishing when we're doing those in the Discord. So if you want to engage with us, get involved in the conversation, uh, we're going to be doing some debates, asking questions. Check out the Discord. Come join us for those. Uh, I think they're going to be a lot of fun and, and a lot of uh, variety. Um, of course the discord community is kicking ass and we appreciate you guys very much. And we've got memberships and supers and swag. We're actually becoming a, like a real, a real outfit here. Um, speaking of those membership tiers, we really want to thank our nuclear reactors, our top level supporters, Randy and Cindy mountains of tinfoil and our newest member, Juan Martinez. Thank you for jumping in. My friend, we saw you involved in the, uh, in the live stream last night, the state of the union address, even though I wasn't here. I thought you guys did a great job. Not too many technical difficulties. No, we didn't. It seemed like you guys had it, it going. It all worked. Good. Did it without pops. I'm so proud of Thank you guys. God. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and I can't believe that I've literally missed every single live stream that we've ever done. And it's like every time I'm like, God, I really want to be there for the live stream. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> Uh, anyway, if you would like to get involved in all that cool exclusive members only stuff, uh, we would love to have you. Uh, for three dollars on YouTube, you can get access to our exclusive channels on Discord and some special emojis and loyalty badges for eight bucks. And for our Substack people who who want to spend time over there, we've got members only written and video content over there, as well as exclusive discounts on HR merch, which you can find at humanreactionpod.com. And then for our nuclear reactors, you're getting to join in live for interviews that we do. Uh, we're excited to get into doing that. You guys can basically join in as the audience when we're interviewing a guest, ask questions in real time. Uh, you'll get early access to all of our weekly episodes, a yearly free merch drop, 
And last but not least, you get your name in the show credits and, of course, a good mention on the show itself. All right. My bad. Formalities out of the way. (laughs) What did you guys think of the State of the Union? Fill Um, me in. I didn't get to watch it because I was in the curling playoffs. (laughs) If you really want to know what we think, you got to get in as a nuclear reactor, which got a Substack email this morning to a private link where you can watch the whole thing as uh, reacting live to it. But I think overall, the short story... Biden did a little bit better than we thought. Maybe we had ridiculously low expectations. We thought he would just like get up on stage, fall down, get up like, you know, like, and then, you know, it it did take him 30 minutes to walk to the stage. That did happen. Really? It's the class. It, we're kind of joking about it, but it's how it always goes. They always like oh, move you two shake steps, hands shake and, hands, be yeah. like, "Yes, I'm going to bomb them too." Yes, yeah. and then they move on to the next one, right? Uh-huh. Well, this that time, happens. this time, what was interesting is one of the, one of the biggest things he did was be like, "I'm handing out pharmaceuticals." Like, "Hey, you want to you want a new pharmaceutical? You got it. You want a new bridge? You got it." Like, he's going down the aisle, like just handing making out it, making dollars. it rain with yeah, taxpayer yeah, right. dollars. <laughs> oh, that's um, hilarious. Yeah, no, I I thought that he did. He performed well, very well, and I felt like it showed his 40,000 years of political experience. <laughs> um, it, like he, he, he was like, <laughs> there, there was two or three, there was two or three times where he was quipping back and forth with the Republicans. Cause they'd like boo him and he'd be like, Oh, you didn't think so. You know? And he would do that, yeah. which is what I'm familiar with. Like if you watch old Biden footage, that's what he would do back in the past too. He was very good at those types of like quick wittedness crowd work. And we just haven't seen that as much lately. And I think it's largely because we see all of his gaffes and there's a numerous amount of gaffes, but there was no big gaffable moments or anything. He, he had a few like word slurs where he's just like, and then a strong person would go to you. And then he would do that and kind of move on. <laughs> and but it was, was like, very, yes. it, it wasn't that bad as I think we're used to seeing. Yeah. What did yeah. you think about that moment where he, he said that the COVID shot uh, cures cancer or something like that? What did he say? I- well, basically, yeah. Well, <laughs> they are using mRNA vaccines to try to come up with a vaccine for cancer. And there's like this moonshot program that he started last year to I do see. that. Okay. Um, so, so he maybe misspoke a little bit on that, but it's sort of adjacent to what's actually yeah, happening. It did make like- it sound like the 10th booster was going to cure cancer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it did make it sound <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure. Uh, we'll find out. The Discord was skeptical. That's what, that's what, that's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the topic of our TikTok live. Will the 10th booster cure cancer? Or the 10th booster cures cancer. Change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. What were your other thoughts? Uh, well, uh, Trump uh, responded back with some tweets, some live tweeting. Uh, some of it didn't land that well. This is one of the ones that did not. Yeah, so he was, he was quoting. He was truthing. He was... Truth. You know, as, as, you, as you do there, he was true thing that the pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccines that saved us from COVID are now being used to help beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That was a, I, I believe he's quoting, he's quoting Biden, Biden in that moment. Yeah. But then he says, you're welcome, Joe. Nine month approval time versus 12 years that it would have taken you. And a lot of people are kind of because the Trump supporters are kind of the vaccine skeptics, you know? So there's kind of a weird disconnect that happens anytime COVID vaccine stuff happens because he's always like, it's the greatest. It was the best. And they're like, "Eh," you know, but like, (laughs) (laughs) Eh, like, no, 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 no. (laughs) it was the sign of Satan. (laughs) Well, I mean, even even if it if your opinion is not that extreme, it's like, okay, obviously the data is now showing that it was nowhere near as effective as anyone ever claimed it was going to be. Right. And those are that those are the means. The hard part for me here is like. Is he just so wrapped up in the ego of having brought that to market so quickly that he's unable to listen to the people around him that are maybe hopefully telling him like, hey, uh, they didn't actually like save us from COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, maybe we don't. Maybe we dial back that rhetoric or is no one around him actually saying that it could both be true that Project Warp Speed shouldn't. Okay, so we shouldn't have to spend a billion dollars in 12 years to do basic medical research. Sure. Right. In a more free, more open society, in theory, you would be able to more cheaply, you know, roll out drugs that once they're proven safe. Effective is a different question than safe. Was the vaccine safe? All those questions. We'll just leave those questions behind right now and just say, in a, in a free society, you wouldn't have people saying, oh, you don't, you lose your right to free association and travel and all these other things if you don't take this privately provided vaccine. Sure. Right. So if we didn't have that, but we did, what we did have was a situation that, that we deregulated the CDC and the FDA and made it more affordable and easier to bring drugs to market. Would we be in a better situation? 
right? So he, if he owned just that side of it, it'd be one thing, right? But he didn't do that, right? He didn't, there was no major FDA reforms. I mean, if there was one thing that we should have gotten out of the, out of, out of the pandemic, it should have been FDA and CDC reforms. I mean, they botched it so bad. We discovered it like the first two weeks of the pandemic that you couldn't submit data uh, to the CDC about what you've discovered from, as a scientist without like faxing it to them. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Like there was like, we could, we, we can't, you can't do cloud links. Like they had to send like a CD, you know, like things like that. I'd have, to, I'd have to like go to Goodwill and buy a fax machine <laughs> or I'm not even sure. I've they... never faxed something in my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You're dating yourself. Yeah. That, that's uh, really I'm, cool. I'm, I'm, just, I'm the baby on the podcast, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's, that's the, the, you know, that's the sort of thing that we didn't get out of it. That's because Biden became president, right? He's not, he's never going to do that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's, there is a, where, where, where it's right on is he does have an avenue, does have a story he could tell about that. Right. But he never, he doesn't, he's not telling it right. Cause he's trying to say that the vaccine was so great. Right. What he should say is it's an example of what we could do if we reform these other programs. Maybe be more specific and say, we were capable of getting this new technology to market more quickly. And that was impressive. Yes. Nuance is lost in politics, though. You can't explain that all in sound bites. And that's what you need. You could say exactly what I just said. It's three no, seconds. In, instead, you need like five, five word exclamations in all caps saying, the drugs are wearing off. <laughs> <laughs> As Trump was live tweeting on the debate, I just pulled these screenshots from Laura Loomer, just L- tweeted them. And I was just live like, truthing. Yeah, live truthing. Uh, uh, truths, the drugs are wearing off. I, to be honest, I didn't feel like the lo- there was that much of a low for Biden over the the course of the entire thing i thought that the energy was kept up throughout well when most people recognize and we they did have several tweets on that in fact our own t- chat had that which is that in speeches in general you start off high and then you get lower as you go possibly right you want a arc and flow in a speech right you want ups and downs of valleys and he definitely didn't end on the same amount of energy he started with so but i mm-hmm. just i would have suspected it to be much lower yeah, especially with the whole drugs are wearing off meme just, of it. Right? Still yeah. disappointed we never got a whisper. We never got that. Oh, oh, did he did? He didn't, he didn't he give did. the real There was whisper. a moment where he whispered for like two minutes. Nah, yes. he, he just got quieter. I want the real like. And then we we were gonna, we're gonna cure cancer, guys. You know, like that sort of <laughs> thing, like that real whisper, that yeah. ASMR. Uh, uh, was uh, more examples here of uh, Trump uh, Trump's tweet or true thing. Truth. And this is what Dave was alluding to with he, him finding Snapchat filters Dude. is uh, incredible. This. It's it's going to be really hard to describe to the audio only listeners. You know what? This is the moment for the audio only listeners to just really quickly switch over to video. Switch over to YouTube <laughs> or Spotify and watch it. Yeah. That's right. Buy America. <laughs> You're buy America. Oh so trade rules. Buy America has been the law since 1933. Guys, guys. Also, oh my God. what are you going to fix? He, he, had, he, had the, he had the bug eyes one on, and now he's got and like, way, oh, now, now he's got a Pinocchio written, nose with rings falling. And the benefit expires in 2025. Trying to catch on his nose. New Holy shit. Bridge, <laughs> able to weather major storms and not prevent those fire, forest fires. Do- Donald, Trump, Donald Trump tweeted that. Yeah. Uh, truth, I mean, truth day. Yeah. He truth day. He didn't this tweet it. This is nothing but truth. nothing but truth. Truth. Cold, hard truth. Um, I think there is there is a we and we talked about this a bit on the live stream last night was uh, how effective is it for Donald Trump to just exclusively be on truth still because I I looked up the numbers last night and it's only it's two million active users and those are going to be the diehards right like you're not going on there unless you are a diehard Trump supporter. I mean, I would say I don't think that it matters that much because there are so way over exactly there are there's an army of trump acolytes that will repost everything he does to every platform that exists so yes but, but like i'm just gonna pull up donald trump i'm just saying twitter the message account. gets out right I'm, I'm just gonna pull up his twitter account itself where because he has he has 87 million followers here and so many people like i have notifications on for him right <laughs> like, nerd um, yeah i mean but I it's I not like to, i get notifications to him because yeah, right. his only tweet this year is the mug shot <laughs> I mean, I think it's a valid question. And and if I were in his there camp, I would be considering, okay, well, other accounts are reposting his his truths and getting, <laughs> I know that's just so funny to say, are reposting his posts and, and getting the traffic from that. So we could be capturing those eyeballs to his, his account. But does he need them, I guess, is the question. Does he care? He's running for president. He should. Yeah, I think he definitely yep. should be. And, yep. and Elon brought him back. Like, that's just 
the long and the short of it. And he had an exclusivity deal, deal, I believe, with Truth Social about how he would only post on there for like the first year or two. But I'm pretty sure that's up now, which I'm actually I'm pretty sure it was up when this happened. If you are a small business owner looking for exponential growth, you have to connect with Adam Thune at Intellectual Patriots. He will revolutionize your business game and help you get to the next level. Adam can streamline your business practices and advertising strategies to improve your bottom line. His expertise in data engineering means he can build you the systems you need to collect and analyze market data. His mission is to provide you with invaluable insights to fuel your success. From grant writing and business proposals to digital systems integrations, even AI management, Intellectual Patriots is a one-stop shop for cutting-edge solutions. Don't wait another second. Visit intelpatriots.com to learn more. That's I-N-T-E-L patriots.com. This episode is brought to you by Revved Up Promo, the official apparel partner of Human Reaction. Revved Up is a premier full-service shop specializing in laser engraving, screen printing, and embroidery. Not only are they now making all of our apparel right down the road from us, they can do the same for your brand and ship it to you anywhere in the world. Revved Up helps you navigate the extensive universe of merch options and uses state-of-the-art techniques to showcase your brand in its very best light. So if you want to support our show and our generous sponsor, you can now do so by buying our merch and by turning to Revved Up Promo for your own custom apparel needs. Reach them at revveduppromo.com. That's with two V's and two P's, or just check the show notes for a link. How does he have, oh, it's up at the top, 59.1 thousand posts. Well, that's easy. Uh, that's easy. Really? I, mean, I like things like reposts and stuff. He's, been, he's been on, he's been on, on since time. the beginning. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, that, yeah. I guess yeah. that's, that's, easy. Yeah. that's fair. Like every repost is a post. And he does tweet five sentence long tweets the drugs are wearing off you know that sort of thing oh like, yeah know, five, five word sentences yeah. Yeah. yeah even mexico you know like whatever right so yeah mm. state of the union happened it was interesting but there was there was a clip that was going kind of semi-viral last night um from the republican response yeah and i think that we should oh, play it because yes, it, it's should. it's interesting it has this an interesting is, energy this to is it. a <laughs> this is uh, more, senator katie Britt from alabama yeah talking meanwhile the chinese communist party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland. Did you not watch this thing? Spying <laughs> on our military installations and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, <laughs> it conquers America. <laughs> and what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look, we all recall when presidents faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure border. Okay, it so is you, you so get the idea. Bad. People from China, they love me. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh no, sorry, that was, I thought that was me. That, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wow, uh, that was so. I mean, I I had watched like clips of it, but it sounds oh, no, please don't. just <laughs> like her. Yes, him. Contrast. Them. They. <laughs> yeah, it, it just it gave me this energy, and we played on this clip before. If you podcast. look at Putin's mouth, you'll notice that blood drips from it. He's a vampire <laughs> carrying out genocide against both Ukrainians and Russians alike. Vlad Putin bathes. In the blood of innocent children oh, and enjoys it. Just and this is why the dictator of the what Russian Federation must be deposed and why peace talks have to be focused on President Zelensky's 10 point peace formula. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, enough. Yeah, we're good, we're I haven't seen that part of that. Yeah, that, that's, that's a different me. one. That's a different one. I just couldn't, I like find, I couldn't find the first one. But that's uh, all right. Yeah. Oh, God. But we, it, but we it reminds it. me of that. Of that. Was yeah. something about like the pacing, the way their tone is. Like yeah. it just is, so it's like. like the like whisperish like yeah. that. there was this it was it's a so it was a breathy quiver it was like she's so emotional like bad acting <laughs> it was it was very theatrical I was yeah shaking 
she was shaking. <laughs> but then she gets angry at the end, and you're like, oh, God, she's getting angry. But it wasn't stirring. It wasn't like, yeah, like, no, it was like it was she practiced that in the cringy. mirror like 45 times. It's really bad. Yeah. Or like How did times. that make you feel, Kyle? What were your emotions around that? Well, I, I was just, I, I, like I saw a lot of, <laughs> I just saw a lot of people on Twitter that were saying, I am terrified, but strangely aroused. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was what my Twitter feed looked like yeah, last night yeah. when I got home after the live stream. Hmm. Wow. That was wild. Uh, so, I mean, I think very clearly just propaganda, but from the other side, you know? Yeah. And, and to stir emotion. Well, the Republicans were trying to put out their message about it and, you know, show and cultivate female voters by saying hey we have this putting the female first and ban first. TikTok. yeah and, oh yeah of course that's how you get the female voters because they're corrupting the minds of the youth mm -hmm. right yep Just protect like the children books. the yep. intel boys are coming after TikTok right now it seems like they're making moves they already uh, i've been watching it they already got it what do you mean they already got it project texas what's that okay so project texas was an effort like a year ago when all the banned TikTok stuff first came up and it basically was a deal between TikTok and oracle to have TikTok move all their data to Oracle servers and not Chinese servers. Oracle is an American company. It's one of the largest tech companies in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Oracle has a known, accused relationship with the Intel Allegedly. Boys. Allegedly. Alleged uh, relationship with the Intel Boys. So, just like all of them do. Well, sure. We've yeah. and we've covered that Google, <laughs> Oracle, everything, right? Yeah. So, it wouldn't it, it wouldn't they've already been captured. Oh, additionally, that TikTok's you know, American side of the company is owned by Americans. So you think they're going to ban it? Uh, yeah. No, I think they're going to, I Nationally? think they're going to, yeah. I, I think because the, the long-term thing is it. that American company take over or just ends up, you know, all that stuff, right? So the long-term play is that an American company takes over the TikTok app within the United States. Uh, the, uh, I don't, it depends, right? If Google and Facebook out lobby TikTok, yeah. They can they can ban it just for the just for the economic win of that. It has nothing to do with security. It has nothing to do with the future minds of America. Nothing do you do you think that stands or does the the Supreme Court come in and make a judgment on that? Why would the Supreme Court come in on that? Is it not a free speech thing? No, you just government has okay, absolute so right to regulate apps. TikTok right? was, was unfortunately TikTok was banned in Montana and challenged in well, court. Yeah, so but that was because it was very. You know, this would be like a cor hostile corporate whether takeover not, with government action. Yeah, whether or not like government that. can ban a specific... Well, there's a particular part of Montana's constitution that says you can't go after a singular company, and that's the major problem. You can or cannot? Cannot. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That does, I don't, I'm not familiar with that argument for the federal level, but hmm. it could be there. Okay. I well, I guess we'll question. have to see. Yep. In the meantime... Follow us on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the speaking, freest platform. Yeah. It seems to be, actually. Um, at least from our numbers. <laughs> so, well, it's also the only place where you can get, where there was a, an open debate about Osama bin Laden's letter to America. Yeah. That to me means something, right? And it, it, a lot of kids took the, the wrong message from it. They're like, Osama bin Laden's like colonial and, you know, he's therefore right. They'll frame it in yeah. weird ways. Yeah, right. right. They always, they always like to discover something actually interesting than, than frame it wrong. But, yeah. you know, it, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Like what is the freest platform? Where, where can you actually build an audience where you criticize criticize the government. That's well, and, and do Americans have the right to utilize technology that they want to engage with, mm -hmm. you know? Anywhere know. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's speaking of the Supreme Court, what, what else happened this week? Well, they said uh, Trump is on all the ballots. Um, basically, there was a ruling nine to zero. Like the, everybody, including Kagan, the most liberal justices. That's the ruled. surprising thing is that is that you actually got the liberal judges on this. Yeah, they reversed the Colorado Supreme Court, which said because Trump was accused of an insurrection, therefore he couldn't be on the ballot, and basically said that the the relevant area here is uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which was a response to the Civil War, right? We all remember this. We did some coverage of it last summer, I think, that said that if you swore on the Constitution and then betrayed it, functionally you wouldn't be able to hold office anymore and basically what they said is yep that's still there it's valid but colorado doesn't get to make that decision if they want to implement something in that in that part of the constitution it's up to congress to do so well didn't they say that if if colorado wanted to leverage that they could within state elections but not at the federal level that's yes. not for them to decide yes yeah yeah i mean and this and this is true in general like so in montana for example your your state elections governed by the copp 
But your federal elections have completely different rules, and they're governed by the FEC. So depending on what office you run for, it's regulated differently because mm-hmm. different. it's a different government, right? It's important to think of it that way. So does this prevent... This, this prevents other states from trying to do the same thing. Yeah, it nullifies Maine and all the other ones that actually had process. And it was just Colorado was like the first of the states to make moves. And what uh, what's the response been to this from from the left? Uh, great question. We got this uh, video from Steve, uh, Steph, Stephen Stephen Colbert. Stephen <laughs> Stephon Colbert. <laughs> no. I thought they were going to say and Stephen Cur- and Stephen Curry just decided. To get here. <laughs> Steph like, Curry <laughs> dropping three from downtown. <laughs> No, Stephen Colbert, uh, you know, late night show host, brilliant mind. Welcome down here, up there, all around the world to The Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. The big story. The big story today is the Supreme Court once again shoving their gavels up the election. Don't forget to pause it. Longtime viewers of America will remember that Colorado kicked Trump off the ballot because of the whole launching a violent coup so he could stay in office violating the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause. Well, today... So we, we got to pause it very frequently. Otherwise, we're going to get like a, uh, an account ban hit oh, sort sure. of thing. Sure. Uh, copyright, because uh, CBS hates anyone commenting on their stuff, even if it's fair use. But uh, notice how he queued up the crowd there. Uh, very specifically, like, oh, you got to think about it this way. Shoving their gavels up the, up the election. Which <laughs> is a funny joke. Very but, graphic. Very yeah, graphic. Yeah, a little bit ridiculous especially because this is a very bipartisan decision like it can't be more bipartisan than that right unanimous decision yeah um carry on yeah the supreme court said trump can stay on all state ballots in a unanimous ruling a ruling so do you think they have I like agree. a like a boo sign right next to the applause sign that's in the my studio? understanding of how these work do they really have most of these uh like I, I think they pick and choose audience members too. And I think sometimes they like move audience members if they're not like closer things. to the mics. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a, I think there's a dynamic that exists there, but I, I'm pretty sure that they have signs that are like boo applause. It's very scripted. And I think they put Bennett close to the mic for the boo side. I'm pretty sure that being said, boo. I've never been to one of these shows. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I would ever be caught dead in one of these shows. Yeah. yeah. Could you imagine like you are, you are a prop. Yeah. That's what you're here for. Yeah. yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Because I, and I, no, but this wouldn't be the same thing for this type of a show, but other shows that aren't necessarily like current events related. I think they queue up a lot of the shows too. So they have like people coming in and then they shoot. And then like two hours later, they have like the next one that goes and yeah. stuff. It's not the same for these late night shows because they are current events based, sure. but yeah. Price shows, is right. They'll just run. Six yeah. Like of Ellen DeGeneres and things like that. Like oh, those sure. types of shows. I, th- I think that's how that works. I can see that. Um, I might be wrong on specifically who, but if you're so a producer, <laughs> let us know in the comments, how do they run these shows? Thanks. It is a ruling that I will remind you no one has to follow because last week I declared the Supreme Court unconstitutional. So. Got Andrew Jackson over here. Fact check on that one. I did that, right? You did that. So states, feel free to kick him off your ballot. Tell him Colbert says it's okay. I got your back. (laughs) You're dealing with me now. That was just the Constitution. You're dealing with me now. A funny joke. The justices claim that since different. Is that funny? Like, what is that? What is that? Well, it depends. It depends which cultural milieu you're in. Yeah, but but right? think about it for a minute. Like, these are the same people who were anytime when Obamacare was decided as constitutional, even though it's obviously not. Violates the Constitution in a very important way, where taxes come from and all that kind of stuff. And they basically pretty much just hand waved it away in the in the final decision. They were all like, "Well, yeah, this this makes it constitutional, right?" I mean, it just shows the tribalism is number one, and any ideas or thoughts or in the nature of government is number 10 like way down the list Mm -hmm. and i I just i just find it so gross like it it, i'm really open question is this comedy or is it indoctrination really well i mean i just objectively i feel like i can laugh at anything if it's funny like it doesn't matter if it agrees with me or makes fun of me or you know whatever that doesn't matter but uh, that's not funny yeah Yeah, i think it depends yeah i think it depends (laughs) which which milieu you're in like we're this is not made for us yeah right that's right. why that's why it feels wrong but that but is that funny to anybody like is anyone's like ah yeah you're yeah, like yeah. oh you, you, you determined them to be unconstitutional that's you know like, I, of the I, land. If, if you're in that's that funny. if you're in that culture i think i think you you try to make it seem funny to yourself because it's it's something that you're agreeing with right? someone's on their couch like a, yeah stephen colbert should be the supreme emperor of the united states <laughs> well, yeah. well no yeah <laughs> no because no, because he's pointing out the but, irony because he's just like oh trump's super unconstitutional yeah. so i'm gonna ban the constitution you know yeah he's putting that whole yeah 
string of logic. Got you here, back. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't make me defend Stephen Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> but. Different states have different standards for what would qualify as insurrection. Conflicting state outcomes would lead to chaos. Yes, the Supreme Court knows you can't just let states decide who goes on their ballots. States are too busy deciding that life begins in the freezer section. <laughs> So that's Next a reference to, to abortion abortion, and the, the, their decision to withdraw. It was the Dobbs case to basically end the government, the, the Supreme Court's fiat on making a decision for the states on abortion. Right. I actually thought that one was decent. That was a decent reference. Like, the, like not like a laugh out loud funny joke, but yeah. I was like, oh, that was... That was I right. see the logic. Yeah. I see the attempt yeah, at yeah, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The freezer section is yeah. pretty oh. crass, you know, mm. to talk about babies that way but you know fuck now, out, so. you know life so is he supposed to be catholic yeah he is very anyway here here's scotus's basic rationale so the majority Haley, right? says <laughs> that disqualifying a candidate for insurrection can only occur when congress passes legislation okay quick question if congress does decide to pass that legislation to disqualify a candidate for insurrection what if he sends his mob to storm congress to stop them from passing that legislation does that count as insurrection or do they have to pass more legislation about that before the next mob shows up i'm just asking because clearly you guys haven't put any thought into any of this stuff oh, 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 okay. I, will, I will say i don't think it's going to happen again because they put a fence up it's true. <laughs> true. They put a fence up before the State of the Union address. To keep out the Palestinian protesters. Yeah. <laughs> By the way. By, uh, I, but I mean, fences work for everybody, right? Yeah, right. Well, By the way. We work on MAGA, right? We know that. Was it, I think it was in the Discord. I uh, saw this. Credit to Steve Danes for clowning on Joe Biden for putting up a Every wall. Every senator is putting up yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, their, that, was, that, was, uh, that was pretty He might have yeah. been one of the first ones. That was pretty funny. Yeah, he had like a little six second video just being like, walls work. Ha ha, Biden. Ha ha. Ha but that, uh, see, was that funny? Was that funny? Right? Right? Like, it, it didn't, it's once again, seemed like they were laughing. They're like, ooh, good point. And I was like, that's not a good point. It's not very clever. Like, I've, I've thought he's funny in the past, but that didn't seem very clever. Oh, he was way funnier on, on the Colbert Report. I mean, like, but he was also than this. playing a character on that. Which is funny. Yeah, no, I'm, not, <laughs> yeah, I'm agreeing. Right. Like, yeah. the, now it's just him. Is he not playing a character here? No, no, he doesn't. Th this really is just so. him now. Yeah, uh, this, this is, is just comedian now. Stephen Colbert, where he, he used to pretend to be like, like he's like I'm Bill O'Reilly as a character right. on the Colbert Report. But uh, okay. then he got the late night show, and and the that character is gone. Now oh, he's Keith Olbermann. Yeah, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's slightly funnier Keith Olbermann. Got it. Okay, uh, I wouldn't maybe go that far. <laughs> Well, okay. So I think, I think, is it news comedy? I, I, I feel like you would hear that. And if you had the sense of, oh, I now understand the rationale the Supreme Court made the decision here. And I now understand like the way the separation of powers or the way the delegated powers to the federal government versus state governments work. I'm not sure you would get that out of this. I think you would just go like, oh yeah, he dunked on the right and they're all stupid. And the Supreme Court's owned by Trump now. Even though it, you wouldn't even know it was nine to zero out of that. Well, I mean, he did say unanimously up front. So, yeah, but, but he, he kind of, I mean, he didn't, they, like, they he didn't make the point like Kagan, the most liberal justice we've had probably since the progressive era decided this, right? Yeah. I mean, like it, it isn't, it, it inter, a partisan lens here makes no sense whatsoever. So, okay. Well, but one thing, one thing this, this judgment does do, and, and this is a question, I suppose, um, does it sort of reinforce like federal supremacy essentially? Well, it says like, you know, the federal government has the right to decide this. The states don't. Yeah. But the, it reinforces it in the area of elections, right? That the, so, the federal government's the only one who can determine when elections happen and how they happen for right. elective office for the feds. So, I mean, but that would maybe be the, one of the reasons why a left leaning justice would say, well, of course, like this has to go this way because we don't want to reinforce the ability for the states to just like make, all these different decisions based around federal elections. Right. So like the conservatives, for example, in 1994 passed a, um, a amendment to the U S constant, not well, no, states, Montana being one of them passed amendments to their constitution saying that their Senator and representatives can only serve for certain months of time, implementing a, um, a limit on 
when a federal elective uh, office holder can stay in office. And that was struck down by the Supreme Court specifically because of the same rationale. The term limits. Idea. Yeah, you can't, yeah. the states can't implement a term limit on a federal official. Sure. So with that, and, and forgive me if I'm, you know, jumping the gun here, there has, there have been some movements in Congress, the U.S. Congress around introducing a bill to kind of do the same thing that, that Colorado did at the state level, correct? To prevent Trump from being on the ballot in some way? Wasn't there, yeah, wasn't yeah, there something being Congress drafted? Though. It doesn't matter. It's not gonna, there's no way the Republican House passes that. So, so but still, there, the, if there were to be something that was done to yeah. affect this issue, it would have to be done through Congress. Yeah, but you couldn't write it. You, I'm, I'm, I doubt you could write a, a bill that would say Donald Trump can't be president. It would be a president who does speech that results in the threatening of officials can't become president or something like that. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. It, and it would have to be in pursuant of article, th- you know, amendment 14 article or subsection three, a president who does this can't become president. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Shall we keep going? Yeah, no, that's it. That's no. it. Okay. I, I, I just want to say, cause, propaganda. yeah, because <laughs> I, I think you guys are kind of like, there's no truth here. So it's kind of bad, but that's not his role, right? Oh yeah. His, no. his role is like, if you watch the documentary, uh, the hunger games, you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where you have <laughs> nice, <laughs> um, that was funnier than <laughs> Stephen Colbert in that whole time. But that, we didn't have the, a laugh track of people going, ha, 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 no, ha, you're supposed to laugh to that. No, that's no, what ticks me off. Our, our, our laugh track is Bennett in the background. If, it, <laughs> if it's funny, you don't need a, a pre-king laugh track and like, you know, in like, in like sitcoms, or you don't need a live studio audience with a light that goes on. Yeah. Right? But, but, but that's, Haley that's the role tweets. that he has. Yeah. Yeah. Something right. like that. That's really that was exactly. <laughs> yeah, but that's the role that he has yes. is it's, a, it's supposed to be, propaganda laced with like a layer of comedy in order to push certain narratives like so that it captures a certain segment of people because that's how democracy works you need a certain segment of people and then you capture them under like some sort of narrative apparatus that's all that his job is it's like in the hunger games where you have like the big show before the games happen and there and everybody's like cheering and you have to put the narrative together and mm-hmm. you're like this is the narrative of why this can't this this person that's going to be competing should win and you and you create propaganda all around it like that's what this is that's a really interesting mm-hmm. point it's like so what he's what he is doing is making statements about what he wants people to believe is true, but it's all cloaked in comedy. So if someone were to actually say, well, actually that's, that's not at all how this works. They'd say, Oh, well, he's just making a joke. It's a late night show. He's just making a joke. He's a comedian, but they're going to take that nugget away and probably at some point later in a conversation, bring that back to the service as if it's true. Well, you know, I heard on Stephen Colbert, this that and, the yeah, other and that's the role that like john oliver plays Correct. or like these people oh is there was a there was a like a week ago we don't have the clip prepared but bill maher had a whole thing and bill maher tends to be a little bit better than a lot of these people i think from our kind of cultural take there's areas where we're like oh, <laughs> you know but yeah. there was a moment where he was um i think he was quoting jack posobic and he was just taking a quote at face value that his writers put in front of him he clearly didn't look at it before and he's reading it and it's like, yeah. And then we're going to storm the Capitol and we're going to take it all. And they're just like, but it was, it was clearly a joke. Like if you were actually reading it in real time, it was all a joke, but he's just seeing it out of context. And he's just like, Oh my God, can you believe this is what they're saying over on the other side? And he's just completely out of touch. Yeah. Is there something I'm missing? Is there something I don't get? And then one woman, the woman that was next to him, I can't remember her name. She's a Republican. And she's like, no, it's clearly a joke. And this is what happened. And he's just like, Oh, well, well, it was, Jack Posobiec, don't quit your day job. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's, he's trying funny. to get the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. He, and, yeah. but, I, but I think there's an element there of like the writers in the background. A lot of them, they're getting the things written for them too. Right. And they're just performing the things that are written. And a lot of the things are actually the writers behind the scenes that are doing things. It's sort of like a managerial class element it's sort of that like, exists there. It's sort of like the Biden administration, actually. Yeah, he, he's just a it's performance like, artist in front yeah. <laughs> doing what's written for him. Yeah. That's what politicians sort of like are. like the State of the Union. That's what politicians typically are, is they're performance artists having things written for them totally. by a large staff. Completely. Right? Some policy. And I shouldn't just say the Biden Most, administration. Yeah. yeah, not all. Lots of administrations. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So what is also funny, obviously the mean tweets from Morath, mother of neocons. <laughs> that's, that's that a is a good joke. That's a good one. 
is uh, she 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 pulled out and she's gonna go live in her cocoon and return one day to rule us all. So that's uh, before we get into this, uh, Joe. (laughs) How's the fit? Yes, Kyle. (laughs) How's she looking? She's kind of blending in a little bit. I feel with like that she background. should have worn black for this uh, morning. <laughs> I I considered wearing black for this morning because uh, you're always wearing black, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss I'm gonna miss uh, you know getting to offer my takes on Nikki, but uh, I'm glad that maybe I might I might outlive this meme and maybe. Uh, Return no. with something new and, and innovative and different instead of being pigeonholed into this thing that you guys have thrust upon me <laughs> for you weeks, did it to yourself. months. Okay, here's uh, uh, she looks she looks great. She blends in with the flags, but it's fine. That's a terrible. She's fading yeah, into the distance par- anyway. <laughs> yeah, so this is a metaphor. She, she's it's wearing a metaphor. a metaphor for her political <laughs> campaign for president. She's fading into the background. Mm-hmm. Actually, we'll see you later. Actually, I have an idea. This just made me spark an idea of what that metaphor might be, but I think that we need to listen to her first before okay. we, uh, cause I think that it'll be part of the clip here. Just over a year ago, I launched my campaign for president. When I began, I said the campaign was grounded in my love for our country. Just last week, my mother, a first generation immigrant got to vote for her daughter for president. Only in America. That was the person I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. (laughs) And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. Raytheon. Our national debt will eventually crush Lockheed, our Raytheon, economy. Which one, which one we got? A smaller federal government is not only necessary for our freedom, it is necessary for our survival. The road to socialism is the road to ruin for America. Our Congress is dysfunctional and only getting worse. It is filled with followers, not leaders. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Our world is on fire because of America's retreat. And also bombs. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. But it's also more than that. If we retreat further, there will be more war, not less. We're going to fight wars to stop wars. While we stand strong for the cause of freedom. We must bind we together must as Americans. To communism. That's what we must said. turn away from the darkness of hatred and division. I will continue to promote all That's those values, as is the right of every American. I sought the honor of being your president. But in our great country, being a private citizen is privilege enough in itself. And that's a privilege I very much look forward to enjoying. I'm sure she will as a private citizen. In all citizen. likelihood, Donald <laughs> Trump will be the Republican be nice. nominee yeah. when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. I have always been a conservative Republican hey. and always supported the Republican nominee. <laughs> she was a conservative nominee. hero at one point. But on this but question, they liked her, but her as she did on so died. many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd. Always make up your own mind. 83 to 13 percent. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party <laughs> and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his let's, time let's for choosing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mainly wanted to get to the Trump endorsement thing there, which which, which she didn't. Yeah, right? she, she did not endorse. Conspicuously the, absent. Yeah. She said, I wish him well. Yeah. If like she'd wish anyone well. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, and yeah, it was, and then she put in the Margaret Thatcher quote of like, I'm not going to go with the flow, like, I'm not going to go with the group think, right? Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Another metaphor, blood red attire 
for her military industrial complex friends. Right? No, yeah. for being slaughtered. <laughs> slaughtered. <laughs> she didn't wish the only she only won two states. Vermont and DC. DC is not a state. DC doesn't count. It, 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 well, and also if I was if I was like the Trump campaign, I'd be like, yeah, give her DC. Right. It just <laughs> right. It helps with the narrative. Right. 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 And then like in places Actually. like Alabama, out of a out of a half a million voters, she got seventy thousand, seventy seven thousand. That's like ridiculous. That's a blowout. Like you lost by orders, like magnitudes of orders, right? Like mm-hmm. orders of magnitude. You, it is so ridiculous for her to get up and be like, this was a serious campaign. It was like, no, you were a fundraising opportunity for you and the vendors around you and the military industrial complex to try to undermine the Republican president or nominee, eventual nominee. It had yeah. nothing to do with you still, actually having still an Still our president. No. <laughs> and we've known this since December, right? Like, this isn't a surprise to anybody. Yeah. Well, we know. We, we've known this for well past December. Yeah. Well, I know, but I'm like, I'm being generous. Who was it that tweeted, uh, if I were Donald Trump and, and I, you know, became president, I would make Nikki Haley UN ambassador again and then promptly withdraw from the UN. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that would be a very Trumpian move. <laughs> that would be hilarious. It, it, it would be sort of like, remember, when Trump was first elected in 2016 when he's like I'm scouting out all my options having a good meeting with Mitt Romney and then he just completely denied Mitt Romney (laughs) (laughs) Um, interesting so question for Super Tuesday happened and this week that's the other part of the news there yeah yeah, so well yeah while we were listening to this obviously we were seeing the results roll in from all the states that that held primaries and caucuses um, on Super Tuesday and it was just an absolute bloodbath Mm mm-hmm so how long until we get an announcement do you think from the trump campaign pres- presumed nominee at this point um uh, with a, a running mate or something like that is that post um rnc Th- that, situation that would actually be the thing and i'm glad that the republican primary is basically officially over until the convention right so that he can actually that can be where the discussion is had um among that crowd at right? the convention um or, or just like even just like the internet space, political commentators, those types of things. Like they can be now all of all of like the you know the collection of this blob uh, that is the Republican Party can have like real conversations about who should fill what cabinet positions. Because mm. right now is this kind of it's kind of like things on the edges that people are talking about, but everybody still is very focused on the campaign itself. Right. And now we can actually move on to what matters, which is staffing policy. What's next? Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, and to be clear here, DC itself doesn't actually have a primary, right? But what they do have is you can do precinct analysis in Northern Virginia. So if you go to, for example, almost all of rural Northern Virginia, Virginia, Donald Trump wins seventy three to twenty five, right? And then when you go to Fairfax, seventy fifty seven to forty percent, Mickey Haley uh, in one Falls Church seventy five to twenty three. Arlington, 74 to 24. These are all in favor of Alexander. Yeah, these are all Nikki Haley crushing in the small bubble just around D.C. In the, it, it, it perfectly, one of the richest districts in America, yes. like like that area, that region, because it's all where all the lobbyists exist for all of the arms manufacturers, finance. You know, it's where J.P. Diamond has a house. Right? Like, right, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 It is. It is. It, and it's a perfect analogy for how this campaign has been it is her cultivating the insiders in the beltway to give her lots of money to run a campaign where no one votes for her. And it was a giant waste. And it frustrates me because the same people who have been pushing people out of primaries and doing all this work on the Senate side and in other areas of the trying to keep Republicans from beating up on Republicans are the same people giving her all this money. Really? Right. Are the same people saying we need, we need to make sure we, you know, we don't have a bunch of contentious primaries in uh, Arizona and o- Ohio and all these other areas, Montana, Montana. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, you know, the same sort of forces are saying, oh yes, but we have to make sure Nikki Haley holds Donald Trump accountable and spends the most amount of money possible when that money could be spent somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's a complete it's waste. So, um, <clears throat> Do you guys think that there's anything to the timing of her dropout with the SCOTUS decision? Yes. 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 That's interesting. She she was just lingering around here to see if he would actually be kind of pulled out of the race. Mm -hmm. And then she would be like the de facto person. Maybe. Yeah. That was her Uh, contingency plan is like, okay, he, he gets, he doesn't get put back on the ballot. Other States get basically the precedent they can pull him. And so then they do. And hopefully she's the presumed nominee otherwise yep interesting 
yeah that that seems to make a lot of sense like she didn't have there was no plan to drop out after super tuesday depending on what happened you know yeah like if, she might have had that bef- you know she might have been planning to drop out after super tuesday just to see where the wind was mm-hmm. maybe yeah but then the scotus decision I, th- I think that's what it was. Yeah. 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 I, well, I mean, she dropped out after Super Tuesday, but it Her, was just when yeah. it was, was the correlation of Super Tuesday with the SCOTUS decision. That's I mean, and, and I imagine that there's probably a lot of fundraising doll, like there's a lot of donor dollars that pulled as soon as the SCOTUS decision happened also. Right. Like yeah. na- now there's like, it's kind of, it's one of those things like it's an investment ROI and mm. they're like, the ROI could be strong if the SCOTUS goes a certain way. And then as soon as that, it's just a pff, right. dumps, right? Well, and, and I'm sure that, you know, her strategy would have been had the scotus gone the other way that oh well you know we're not dropping out we're sticking into the bitter end because it's clear that even the conservative supreme court doesn't support this president blah 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 and you know she can kind of prop herself up on that narrative as well but yep fortunate for um people in third world countries all around the world that nikki haley is now out of the race this episode is brought to you by our friends at zesty beverages they're on a mission to un the standard American diet by crafting drinks with fewer calories and more nutrients from real food. Their lineup of delicious offerings now includes Electric Peak Yerba Mate, postbiotic sodas, keto-friendly, ready-to-drink margaritas, and hard teas. Wondering what a postbiotic soda is? Well, head on over to ZestyBev.com to learn more and find a retailer near you. Once again, check them out online at ZestyBev.com. That's Z-E-S-T-Y-B-E-V.com. So an interesting part of this is, you know, MSNBC and these other folks, the exit polling was asking the question is, what is your motivation for voting this year? What's your top issue? And in Virginia, the top issue was immigration. So we got this really great video from MSNBC <laughs> reconciling with that fact in live. So you want to go down to the video here? Kyle? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just, yeah. Noteworthy Jen Psaki, you know, former press secretary, uh, press secretary right? Oh yeah. Well, these are all, they're, it's, they're, they're all, it's former MSNBC. Yeah, they're, yeah. All, they're all just, <laughs> Now, just, Democrat just operatives re- reminding people who she is and yeah. why she is somewhat important. I mean, if you look at some of these exit polls, I mean, I live in Virginia. Immigration was the number one <laughs> issue. Yeah. Cor- I mean, again, these could change in in Virginia. Well, Virginia does have a border with West Virginia. <laughs> very, very contested area. Thinking, Build a wall. Like, what? Build a wall. So, so like, <laughs> it's a very strange thing because they're like, it's not affecting you. <laughs> it's like how do you explain to somebody that that, uh, uh, that worldview that is like hey i care about my country i know you don't but i do and this is an important part of being part of a country that is you know what i mean like mm-hmm. what is that well there's also an element you, too of you know uh, there's a, there's an element of why would anyone that doesn't share a border with mexico care about this but it's like look at everything that's going on in new york yeah. All the migrants are in New York. Right. Or <laughs> right. everyone right. was freaking out about Martha's Vineyard yeah. having them bust up there. And these yeah, so guys, they're, they're, what they're talking about, the area they're talking about in D.C. is not that far from Martha's Vineyard. There well, and also a, just like, it's not even just the immigration coming over the southern border. It, like Vivek, it kind of got m- memed, but Vivek brought uh, brought to attention the northern border problem. Is like yes. a lot of people are coming in through uh, Canada as well. So it's, it's not just like, like this is an issue that is affecting everywhere right now. I, I think if you were to originally talk about this like 20 years ago, uh, it was more so like, why would you care about this? It's not, you know, you're, you don't live in Texas, but mm-hmm. times have changed in 20 years, right? Right. Well, and, and we've talked before about, you know, Southern border state governors uh, putting migrants on buses and planes and sending them all over the country. So there is this diffusion of the problem to all of the states. And there was just an article on Zero Hedge. I saw the headline that said that, you know, the Biden administration had flown somewhere north of 300,000 migrants all over the country, mm-hmm. but, you know, unbeknownst to American citizens. Mm-hmm. So it's not like Virginia is immune from this by any stretch, obviously. And this, this is everybody's issue to contend with. I guarantee you she lives in a gated community 100%. somewhere in Northern Virginia that has, that never sees any of the consequences. And that's why it's not a geographic issue, but it's a socioeconomic issue. That's right. Well, and remember, uh, Ashley St. Clair and, uh, James O'Keefe covering the Arizona, um, flights that were happening mm-hmm. with migrants like these undocumented people just getting onto flights and being shifted around everywhere like what's going on there too yeah. <laughs> like this is affecting everyone well it is it is for sure and and honestly um and i saw this take somewhere and i i can't uh attribute it unfortunately but um if i were a documented immigrant someone who had gone through the years-long process to become a legal yeah. citizen i would be the most salty about this because nobody likes a line cutter right like 
I, you, you go through all that work, money, time, energy, investment to become a citizen of a country that you care about. And then, and then all of a sudden people are just flooding in. And I mean, who knows if that's affecting you directly economically, but it's certainly like a bit of a slap in the face. And the, the process is an annoying process. The, just the whole getting, yeah, yeah, just getting like, like uh, my, my mom is a, originally a Canadian citizen and got her American citizenship because I was born in America. So I was born American. I'm an anchor so baby. Miles an anchor baby. An anchor baby. <laughs> Miles an anchor right? baby. <laughs> and my, my mom didn't become like an actual citizen until I was like six or seven years old. Yeah. It taking 10 years and many thousands of dollars is very normal. And that's, and that's the crazy part about it. That's what creates so much of the need for illegal immigration to happen. Right. I don't mean like that I endorse it. What I mean is that it increases the demand for an illegal immigration system that can be unofficially endorsed by the president to fulfill the demand for illegal immigrants or immigration that would otherwise happen legally. Yeah. And then for makes it more dangerous because then we don't know who those people are. Right. So if we were to make legal immigration easier, illegal immigration, the incentive to go in illegal, to pay a cartel, to smuggle you across the border or whatever yeah. would go way down. Yeah. I, I, not only that, you have that and then you would have increased enforcement. A great example of this is the Bracero program from the 1970s, or 60s and 70s that did exactly that. Spent more money on and, and implemented enforcement and then also reduced the regulations and on immigration so that we had a, had a predictable decline in illegal immigration at that time. Hmm. That said, there is way more ability to move around the world now than there were in the 1960s and 70s. And because of American foreign policy, there's a tremendous amount of increased amount of supply of, of refugees and things like that all over the world that is making it more difficult. And there might not be, you, you, you might not be able to deregulate yourself completely out of the problem. Um, given those variables, right? If an increase in supply happens that is greater than our ability to pay for it, that's a problem, right? And at some point, there is a there is a cap, right? Um, if, you, if we can't have 100 million people move to America without major sociological and political consequences. Yeah. So how do we balance those things out? Mm -hmm. Well, it probably doesn't start, it probably at least starts with how to enforce to the to, to some degree uh, and give people the tools that they need for that and then how to make it so that if you're a legal immigrant whom we want in America, um, you can get here quicker, easier, and, and more efficiently. And then, la and then next, how do we change American foreign policy so that we're not constantly creating huge refugee crisis like we did in Haiti, which is our, our next story. Yeah, and actually, I just want to give a shout out to Liam because Liam McCollum friend of the show has been on the show before sent us this article and it was a very fascinating uh talking about how the cia orchestrated haiti's 2004 coup so you want to kind of lead into that dave yeah it's what it's a here? fascinating long article um we'll post it in the discord too uh but once again sean you guys uh, send us your best stories uh for the week so we can go over these things because it is a it is a great example one of the kind of playing the story backwards a little bit do you guys remember like the James O'Keefe and things like that, that we were um, in like the vi vi videos from like RFK Jr. at the border? You have oh, these yeah. folks, a lot of, Elon a lot of Chinese. went down there and was like citizen journalism. <laughs> yeah, you got like Chinese folks and you have like people from Africa. And then there's a bunch of people who are Haitian, mm -hmm. right? And I remember even having the conversation back then, like there's a lot of people from Haiti, uh, you know, coming up to the United States as illegal immigrants. Why? Well, this gives you an insight on that. Uh, and basically the story is that there was a State Department official who was a double, was a, who had a, who was basically there as a cover as a State Department, State Party. And we talked about this a little while ago, how the State Department and the CIA often collaborate in this way. The name of this official was Janice L. Elmore. Yeah. Believe, who, right? who was a double for the CIA, right? So they're there as a diplomat, but they're actually a spy. And that this lady using various different local groups throughout the 1990s there was all of this uh militia fighting going on in haiti and she a, a, a guy came in imprisoned a bunch of dudes she helped a jailbreak happen using another faction that then resulted in a coup of that guy because that guy was not being cooperative with the u.s security state for some some good reasons right some of the reasons that i could understand like he wanted to do very commie things um but on the other side of it he was you know, a lot of it was that he just didn't 
wasn't it wasn't didn't want Haiti to be a client vassal state of the United States anymore. And for good reason, because throughout the 1990s, that's what we insisted on. And we we kept on putting disastrous dictators in charge who were screwing up the country. Hmm. So he uh, this coup happens 2000, uh, 2002 to 2004 is kind of like the legacy of when this happens, uh, resulting in a coup and a new guy comes in. Haiti has not had a single year of peace since then. What do you, what does that look like? What do you mean? Constant guerrilla warfare fighting between the different groups. They cannot establish basically anything resembling a peaceful orderly society. There's, and that's just, why, there's just massacres happening constantly. Yes, like really. militia groups. Yeah. Like these armed fighters, just constant like human rights abuses from people in governing body. You know, it's, it's just a, it's madness. It's just like, what would you, what would you would expect from a, really downtrodden third world country right mm-hmm. and, and all of that's happening and it's in our sphere of influence right like it's right there haiti so yeah. the um for those that don't know caribbean country correct yes yeah so the uh map. this this was revealed to us it's really interesting around the circumstance around that on accident so the gray zone put in a intelligence like a FOIA request and the and, and this this was probably accidentally given to the gray zone <laughs> As a result of that FOIA request. Oh, so it, this, uh, that was going to be my next question is what's the, uh, the, the substance of the reporting here? This is a FOIA document. So these, yeah. these are official government documents that we got access to or, or the gray zone did. Yes. Yes. And, and, and their reporting on this shows that it was this lady who was a state department cover working for the CIA who helped do this jailbreak, which resulted in this coup, which is, you know, as a result, we can then extrapolate one of the major problems with. A, uh, and it's not like a small jailbreak. Like two hundred people got out. I want to know most of them associated with a massacre that they were in prison for, where they killed a bunch of the old regime. This is some spy novel stuff here. I want to know more about mm-hmm. this jailbreak. Do we have any more details on that? Um, what do you want to know? <laughs> How did <laughs> it go down? It. What did, did they just blow a hole in the wall? And oh, like God, they smuggle them out? Saw a bulldozer in the article. I was like, mm-hmm. reading. yeah. I mean, it's it's that sort of dramatic like assault created a hole in the wall they all like escape and and then yeah Wild. yeah that's exactly yeah that's what i remember right i i, mm-hmm. I read this a week ago so it's not and the people t- head. the people that escaped they were you said there were 200 like a uh, bad people i imagine Look, yeah i mean a lot of them were in jail not all of them but a lot of the people were in jail for a massacre of the other side in the 1990s where the other side had power they came in killed a bunch of the guys and then they then the power switched and they got put in prison for that yeah, but those guys were our friends, right? The massacre ones. So that's how we got. That's why we got them out. The ones who did the massacre in the '90s were U.S. friendly, ish. They were, they were just more willing to to deal. It, it's so, it's it's wow. sort of like ISIS. Yeah. Like they're not our friends, but we kind of arm them sometimes. It was like yeah. Osama bin Laden a while ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. or yeah. Al Qaeda in, yeah. 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 in Syria. Good guys, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Bad guys. Okay, so um, just a, what was it, a week ago? We have this uh, Fox News story of a Haitian immigrant who sexually assaulted uh, a woman I gotta bring it up here because i'm actually forgetting off the top of my head yeah I'm where it was it right was it in new york uh no it was texas brownsville texas in december 2022 right so like the the real crisis here the real tragedy is the c and this is a great example of blowback just on a smaller scale we have the cia overthrows you know this this election this 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 you know does a prison break it cascades into years of crisis for Haiti. People try to escape. Some of them just regular people who just want to get away from the murder and, and destruction and mayhem. And then you got, you know, a guy like this who is amongst those pe- regular folks who just want to get, get away from the murder, destruction, and mayhem. And then he comes to the United States, assaults a woman. All the people that also immigrated with him are now cast in a similar light because they're from the same place. And they're seen as being terrible human beings, even though a lot of them are just our actual asylum seekers from our foreign policy of the our intelligence boys. I think this is such an important point because, I mean, I've had conversations where uh, with people who would say, yes, open war in the Middle East or wherever, as we've seen it happen in the last 20 years in the global war on terror is bad. But the United States is a force for good and we have the ability to do these covert operations, these surgical operations to get in and make regime changes and do things that get bad dictators out of power. And, and, and that narrative, that perspective is seen as optimal, but to those people who have those views, this is an example of the fact that 
those actions aren't without consequences. Yes, open war is terrible, but this, it's not like doing these, you know, these covert ops are going to not have consequences on us. And, and like, these are very real consequences. And this is not going to be an isolated situation, right. an isolated case. Well, we're there are a lot about, more people like this What we're guy. talking about is almost a million people who have immigrated to the United States from Haiti and, in the and, last year. And since, you mentioned- oh, sorry, since 2020, uh, 20, 2022. We've so, mentioned in previous episodes as well that, um, you know, we've got, you've got African and Middle Eastern people who are, you know, getting to South America and then coming up to the Southern border, probably also refugees from all the conflicts and things that, that we've played a part in through these regime changes in Libya or the conflicts in Syria yes. or Yemen or other countries where we have a direct impact, maybe not open war, but we're, we're doing things that are causing people to their, their societies are, are dissolving around them. They can't live in peace and they, and they want to get out. Well, and, and, we, coming well, and, and we know and that the see, Arab spring and the resulting conflict for around the Arab spring was encouraged by the intelligence community. We know that now, right? It's been, the, the trick is because it's, because it's covert ops, we can't actually see what's going on. We only know about this because they accidentally told us. <laughs> Otherwise we know 30 years from now. Right. Right. That's the, that's part of the, the, we have to speculate. We have to kind of operate on this edge because we don't live in a democracy or a republic anymore. We live in an empire where they don't have to tell us, the people who are supposed to pick our leaders, what their policies are. Because no one got to vote. Hey, when George Bush ran in 2004, he was like, hey, I'm going to run on overthrowing the government of Haiti using a bunch of criminals, rapists, and thieves. You know, like that's not That what doesn't play that well. <laughs> <laughs> we focus grouped it. And uh, Jan, Jan from Iowa was really not into that. She's just like, well, what does Haiti have to do with us? <laughs> well, but it, it's also, and this is a continuing problem that's going to continue to exist because not only are we getting the initial migration flow that happens from it, it happens decades down the road because you have massive crime problems problems that happen in Central American countries. And we talked about Naib, Naib uh, Bukele. I always forget. I always like stumble on his first name, Naib Bukele, mm. um, who El Salvador had some of the highest crime rates in the world. And now it's one of the lowest in his four year term. But, you know, why was the crime rate so high? Well, we've been propping up gangsters all across the Central America and like running drugs through CIA operations and, you know, and so on and so on. And we only have like glimpses on what happened. We don't have to, we don't know the full story. We see like small declassified areas of what the CIA was doing in the eighties or whatever. But so we can only speculate so much, but clearly we were doing something in there and it's caused massive amounts of problems over decades. Right. Mm -hmm. This, and then people the, continue to migrate. The Haiti yeah. thing feels worse. like a foreshadow of El Salvador because like he's mm. not playing nice now. And mm. I could totally see us being involved in something again. That well, would be terrible. and I, I've mentioned that on here before is there's clear propaganda that's going in from like the Americans, the mm -hmm. IMF, etc., because of what he does. And he he just gets on Twitter and bashes, bashes the empire all the time. Like his Twitter is fire. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Then so, maybe you could just ask your bosses what they have coming down the pipe for that. Yeah. Thanks. We'll do. Yeah. So real quick, we do have two other foreign policy stories that are interesting. We do have a win, right? So we get, we get the win in that we found out that, you know, that Haiti is a, a basket case and partly our fault and we can hold them accountable. But the other one is the, is the, the female Darth Vader of, uh, that's been in on power since Dick Cheney. Bad week for neocons. The Wicked Witch of Western Foreign Policy. I love it. Wicked Witch of Western. That's a great one. Yeah. The Conductor uh, of Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. The, the Ukraine train. <laughs> the Ukraine train. <laughs> the conductor. Folks will remember, and I think we played the audio some time ago, sometime last year, of Victoria Newland basically picking the new government of Ukraine after the 2014 Maidan coup. And that she probably orchestrated because she was State Department, and much like this other lady in Haiti, was probably also double or working alongside with, in congruence with the intelligence boys, uh, to overthrow the Russian-aligned uh, president and put in a friendlier one, using, using, using national socialists' fascistic elements of paramilitary organizations that we supported in Ukraine. Well, she resigned, because she was passed over for a promotion and... Uh, also got some embarrassment in the German press as well. Why was so. she passed over for a promotion? Oh, misogyny, of course. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's that wage gap. <laughs> no, wage gap. <laughs> it, it couldn't possibly be uh, because she is held 
impossibly terrible foreign policy views and tried to accomplish things that have resulted in no. absolute chaos. The guy that replaced her is the dude who organized the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So don't <laughs> don't get don't assume <laughs> that it's because she was incompetent or had the wrong views. <laughs> this is the wrong she way was, to look. She was at actually it. too competent. They were like, nah, I don't know. There's not enough chaos. We need a little more. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I, but I, obviously, I, a lot of people have speculated it's because she wants to be Secretary of State. She's in the third position and she wanted to be in the second position. So she would be queued up for the next neocon to come into office. If it's Trump, she wasn't going to get it. She didn't serve in the last Trump regime either. So did she resign after the Supreme Court case or was that before? I was oh. just wondering that. That's an excellent question. What day was this? Go, to, go down. What day was uh, Liam's, Liam's tweet, tweet here? Because it was the same March, March 5th. 5th. March 5th. When was the SCOTUS decision? It was. That was um, Tuesday. I say it was like, it might have been the same day. I mean, if that's the case, then that's like, okay, that's Trump, Trump's going to get the nomination. I'm not getting Secretary of State, so I'm out. It might have been related. It might have been related. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm uh, curious. By, by the way, because we have a tweet from Liam pull, pulled up. By the way, Liam, I don't know why Twitter does this. I am following you. <laughs> and it was like, anytime I pull up your tweet, it's always like, do you want to follow him? But if I go to your account, like it's like, yeah, you're following him. <laughs> I huh. don't know why. And I notice it mostly with Liam. It happens to other people, but mostly Liam. Weird. I don't know why that is. He's too influential. That up when he was on the show. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I did. It's just every time, like, like I'll click the follow button, but I'm already so following. <laughs> the Supreme Court decision was on the 4th. And when was her decision? The 5th. Well, that's when Liam's the day was. after. It was the day of. I remember. Wow. It may, maybe it was related. Oh, this is, no yeah, one this said is that. I haven't heard anyone else say that. This That's interesting. She, yeah. well, do, do we, she was lying. Original up takes Haley. right here, people. Mm. Do we want to play this uh, this video from her or that Liam posted? About uh, it? It, yeah, it's it's her phone call that was released uh, yeah. that they say was oh, a about Russian Ukraine? intel op. Yeah. 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 I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. In terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. That's I'm just thinking... Ukraine. In terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. Uh, and, that's the ultra right you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Yanukovych I is think the guy Yad that's is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four Those times the a week. Those are the You know, I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk, it's just not going to work. Yeah, so oh, that's that, those Jacob. all happen yeah, to be, right. that was recorded, <laughs> <laughs> those happen to be recorded before all those people were put into power. And then when was that released? After. Mm. Yep. Like how most of these things always are. Yeah, right. right. They always come after the fact. I mean, I mean like Russian, it was probably Russian intelligence intercepted and then released it. Yeah. You guys, I couldn't believe how she looks now versus how she looked before <laughs> and this has nothing to do with the tires <laughs> you're not you're not helping the He's like that about. necklace <laughs> that necklace <laughs> not about it not about it you guys i mean mm, just shocking you, we don't need to show it but just look it up <laughs> what you, what you, you got to do now we have to now was she hot or something it's, like what i'll you? let you i'll let you be the judge of that i'll let you be the judge of that this is not uh I'm you not single guys judge. do, do, do it, your own research <laughs> 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 Not financial Not advice. Financial to advice to your own research. <laughs> NFA DYUR. Uh, okay, so we want to move on. Uh, yes, All let's right. move on. So I, I think that's it. I mean, we had the story came out. I'll put up we, the great Substack article confirmed by Wall Street Journal. There was uh, an interesting story that came out about Germany and Ukraine, but we don't want to get into it. We talk about foreign policy way too much on this podcast, anyways. So, um, anyways, we got to talk about the real stuff now, which the is real stuff. yeah. We went and saw Dune 2. Yeah. Last week. Oh, yeah. sick. It's so good. It was good. What'd you think? I I loved it. Yeah. Um, I mean, as a... Well, I mean, I'm a commercial filmmaker. I'm not like, you know, any sort of hot shot. But man, just freaking beautiful cinematography. Just everything about it was gorgeous. Hard to tell for me. And this is something I, think, I feel like I'm fairly discerning about. Like what CGI and what's not. Yeah. Just so seamless. I, I never felt like... I was never distracted or... Um, uncomfortably focused on production value. Mm -hmm. I was immersed in the story the whole time and it was, it was great. The, the score, the sound design were incredible. Uh, I'm a big audio nerd on that kind of stuff. And it was just, it was all encompassing. It was awesome. 
I'm going to go on a limb and say the worms were probably CGI. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't know. that. I couldn't tell. tell. I couldn't <laughs> tell. <laughs> I'm talking about like the atmosphere. I Bennett. Know, yeah. I just, like, the landscape. It was so <laughs> believable. <laughs> the worms are <laughs> Yeah, Bennett was they sitting got next real to me. Worms. <laughs> and when the emperor's like thing flies in, I was like, oh, it was know, like yeah. just so good. You, you, you knew like, exactly what it was right when it came up on screen, uh-huh. but it was so believable and interesting yeah. and just gorgeous looking. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, did you I see did, it? I didn't watch it. I didn't go with you guys. <laughs> have you read the book? I haven't read the book. I, I have like, I have a bunch of the audiobooks sitting on Audible downloaded and I just haven't read them. Hmm. Very good. What a stupid son of a <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. This is why you're in charge of that now. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, because you can actually get the timing for it. Yeah. You know? Kyle, even go. though you didn't see it, who's your favorite character? <laughs> Well, the worm. <laughs> yeah, have yeah. you seen Dune One? Have you seen no. the Really? No. Oh man, you gotta watch it. It's so good. I I, I thought Victoria yeah. Newland was really great as the worm. I thought she did a really great job. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that cameo either. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh what's going on with crypto? We've got to get you involved in the conversation, the ending conversation here. Uh, okay. with- I mean Bitcoin hit all time highs this morning. Why? Uh, uh BTC. For those that just oh, want to differentiate, oh. for those that want to know which shots fired, which fork of Bitcoin hit all time highs? There's um, only one. I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, the whole the whole crypto market's up right now. Like the whole crypto market is uh, two point seven trillion dollars right now. Mm. Like that's the whole the total market cap. Which one point three trillion of that is Bitcoin, which it's about fifty percent of the market. That's how it always is. BTC. Sorry, Joe. Mm. Um, <laughs> But uh, overall, I, I think that there's a lot of things that the ETFs, there's just massive volume inflows, massive volume inflows. So a lot of Bitcoin is just being bought up from these ETFs, which we've covered before. There's a lot of speculation, not financial advice, on uh, Ethereum ETFs coming around probably May or June. So Ethereum is going to probably be getting some ETFs from what I'm seeing, not financial advice, do your own research. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, but I mean, other than that, like it's just oh, and the Bitcoin having is happening in like two months. Two so months. everything feels as somebody who's been through three cycles, everything feels like we're like eight months ahead of time right now to me. That's like the energy that I'm feeling. It's like what we do you mean sh- ahead of time. There's a classic Bitcoin cycle theory that happens with the crypto markets that is um, having happenings and what the having is is the uh the minting rate of bitcoin gets cut in half so right now it's like 900 bitcoin per day are being made because we're not the the cap is 21 million and that's what always the meme there's only 21 million bitcoin but we're not actually at 21 million yet we're actually lower than that we're currently at uh i think it's like 18 and some no nah, i think we're like 19.5 or something like something that like now um because like market cap when i'm talking about 1.3 trillion market cap that's the price of the bitcoin uh, times how many coins exist so do the math um but uh so the the minting rate is going to be cut from 900 down to 450 per day and then four years after that it gets cut down another half and then another half and then another half all until the year 2140 when like the last quarter of a bitcoin gets mined over four years right mm-hmm. so uh so a lot of usually buying pressure happens after the case on the having but i think people are becoming a little bit more savvy and there's a little bit more institutional buy-in and all this stuff where all of these things are causing price to go up because supply demand blah 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 do you think right. the having is priced in uh no no i, I don't um well i mean the having itself maybe it's hard to say what's priced in what's what's not priced in it's just i think because of the etfs we're going to see constant buy pressure like i i I think that the cycles are going to be less volatile um, over time. I think that we're we're going to see the dips that happen. Like when Bitcoin hit the sixty nine thousand mark, we saw a massive dip down back to like sixty, and then it caught back up. Right. Um, so just like very quick volatility. Um, I recommend people read if people are interested in how, why that type of volatility happens. I recommend a document called the God PTF. Um, it's an old P, uh, or not PTF PDF. It's a kind of an old trader from last cycle there was a kind of a famous document that was made it kind of talks about market manipulation when it comes to price swings like that and and narrative uh 
war in deceptions, things like that. Mm. But uh, that's I'm not going to get into that here. That's a whole <laughs> that's a whole can of worms. Next time that'll but, be uh, a members exclusive. <laughs> yeah, but 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 overall, overall, just price is going up right now. And like, we're going to continue to see volatility. I think that I personally think that we're probably going to see it go much higher across the markets. You know, you have like the meme coins, the gambling coins are going like crazy volatility right now. The more stable things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, like in the, those like kind of blue chips, according to the market, they're much more steady, but overall, like the industry's back. Yeah. The bottom was when everyone went to jail, right? <laughs> Uh, which Sounds I think was right. a fair, pretty clear bottom yeah. signal. That yeah. was like thirty thousand dollars ago. Oh, no, that was yeah. that was like because the bottom was sixteen thousand for Bitcoin, and it's currently sixty eight thousand. Wow. So, so a lot of money. We saw a lot of Bitcoin minted in uh, or mined in twenty ten start to move recently, like uh, two two thousand of them roughly. I think it was like tranches yeah. of like 20 Bitcoin, 50 tranches of 20 Bitcoin, somewhere in there, 1,000 to 2,000. I can't remember the exact number. What do you think that signals? Because that's obviously somebody who was involved very, very early, like at the genesis of Bitcoin, mining it in the very early days, selling or, or, or positioning coins to be sold um, towards these all-time highs right now. Uh, and this is BTC specifically. What does that What does that mean to you? I think the guy probably wanted to sell last cycle and then everything crashed. Missed the top. Yeah, so he missed the top and he's just like, well, I'm going to hit it at 69 this time and probably had a sell order. Interesting. <laughs> well, he didn't have a sell order because he would have had to move to sell it because um, Bitcoin doesn't have all the DEXs like everything on Ethereum happens. DEXs are decentralized exchange, so you don't have to actually move it to a centralized exchange like yeah. Coinbase. You can trade coins yeah. on chain. Um, Bitcoin is less technical technically savvy as uh, as other chains are btc um there's speculation <laughs> I, 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 mean, I mean all the derivatives in <laughs> my opinion all doing, the deriv- huh? Huh? how are well, they doing well, I, mean, huh? I mean all Sorry. the derivatives are less are less savvy than where things that are on like ethereum or cosmos or solana or something don't you wish you could have bought bitcoin at 110 dollars? not not financial advice question <laughs> okay so so there's some speculation on twitter and this is this is in the bsv world that uh that, I don't exist in that world. So that, no, that's I fine. haven't seen it. That's fine. That's totally fine. That these these coins moved uh, adjacent to just after the settlement from the Craig Wright uh, Kleiman trial was determined that $140 million needed to be paid to this, this trust or this company, basically, oh. that, that Craig Wright is an owner of. And those amounts, the amounts of Bitcoin were moved from these early... So are these wallets, Craig's coins? Is these early wallets. Suggested? And the amount that he is due to pay for this settlement uh, are very equivalent at current market value. So there's speculation that this is Craig moving coins because of the, uh, the, the settlement that he has to pay. Could be. So arguably, if he has to pay that, he has to sell the coins. Yeah. What will that do to market value if that is the case? Um, I mean... Right now, so how, how, how much money is that? 140? I think 140 million. 140. Yeah. We're talking about a uh, market cap of 1.3 trillion. Those types of market swings aren't, there's so much liquidity in the market right now that I, it'll cause price movement. Uh, but we're at a point where single people, with the exception of like Satoshi's wallet, or Craig Wright's wallet. <laughs> oh, oh, I think we just heard it from Kyle himself. Satoshi's Craig Wright. I'm, ki- I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Because gotcha. in Satoshi's wallet, there's a million Bitcoin. Yeah, so yeah. that is one nineteenth of the total supply right now, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's in theory one nineteenth of the total supply is actually just off the market unless somebody moved those coins. Sure. And that would cause massive price swings uh, for something like that. Something like this. I mean, it's going to cause a price swing, but. We're at the point where there's so much volume right now. I don't think it really matters. Long. It, it'll, it, it might cause, it might cause people to panic for like two days, mm-hmm. and then it's like. And that's know. a lot of the the narrative around the crypto space, especially Bitcoin, uh, when it comes to like old school people who have been through many cycles, and then the new people who FOMO'd in at the top, and then it goes down, you know, ten grand or, or whatever per coin. That typically isn't very long lived. Right. And, and a lot of these, these dips are moments where, uh, those that have experience in the market are like, not that worried about it. Yeah, no, like I saw, I saw my, I mean, my 
basically my net worth dropped like 10% for two days and then went back up. <laughs> right? like, like I'm just used to that. <laughs> it's like, Crazy. Um, 20% maybe. I guess. Crazy. Yeah. Not financial advice. Like, to I, I don't really, I don't really watch. Uh, I don't really watch the price in that manner anymore. I, I like, I can dip away from the price and just not care uh, quite a bit now. Mm-hmm. Like it's the same thing. Like my, my pudgy penguin assets, um, pudgy penguins went up ridiculous amounts of money and then it we saw a dip by about 20 percent over the last week and then liquidity came in and just pumped it back up to where it, not it's basically back where it was too right it's like it's the same type of deal and markets just work that way um as long as there's confidence and right now i think there's a lot of confidence uh liquidity will come and save it do you feel like the crypto markets are a product of zerp or uh you know just this this general idea the fact that we've had tremendous monetary inflation over the basically the entire lifetime of of cryptocurrency i I think last cycle had a lot of that um like I, i don't think necessarily when i look back at it i don't think the 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 price valuations were justified where they were i think that they are justified now hmm why um because of the technological innovation, especially in, I think Bitcoin's a very different story. Bitcoin and the Bitcoin derivatives, they're, it's a very different thing. But the amount of products that are actually being made on chain in like the Ethereum space or Solana in a sense, I don't like Solana, it's, it's centralized. They just shut down the network for two days at a time. You know, like it's like, it's basically its own CBDC kind of a thing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but, and I'm actually glad that's where all the meme coin like shittery is happening is over on Solana. I'm kind of happy. It's not happening in the other spaces these days. Um, I'm kind of sick of that. I'm I'm in my, I'm in my arc where I'm just kind of, I'm done with like the, the meme coining. (laughs) I'm I'm in my, I'm in my third cycle arc right now where I'm like actually investing in good projects that matter then, uh, and accumulating land because I think the future is, is a democratic process where only the landowners get to vote and, and I think it's you're accumulating the land in crypto space. Mm. I, th- I think that's what's happening um, right now. Um, like if you if you follow me on Twitter, you see that. I think people pro- people on the outside won't really recognize what's happening. But essentially, you have a bunch of people accumulating land in the digital space where those are the votes for governance. When you say land, what do you mean? I mean actual stake in blockchains. Okay. Um, so, so coins, coins, or tokens, but, or whatever. but we're talking about proof of stake currencies, not proof of work currencies. Metaverse. Proof, proof of stake because proof of work in crypto i'm you guys are just having me ramble on this stuff now uh proof of work is bitcoin right proof of work it's it's all about mining it's all very marxist labor theory of value <laughs> well no <laughs> I'm, I'm joking i'm joking i'm joking it's but, it's, but there but the bitcoin maxis treat it like it's very marxist uh oh, sure. labor theory of value like if you listen to them with the ex- it's very, there's a very Marxist bent and they claim uh, to be Austrians. Uh, there's a very Marxist bent to their rhetoric. Interesting. Well, um, weren't a lot of the Austrians sort of that way also? What? What do you mean? I've, I've heard the argument that like uh, Mises was actually like sort of socialist. In what way? Um, I mean, I'll have to dig into the arguments. I'm like, I'm very good. I've never heard this. That's what Iran okay. said. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's good. Well, that's, that's because of the subjective value theory yeah. of, of, the Austrian school, which mm. Ayn Rand disagreed with, but she, which she's, pe- which she's pe- the aberrant in that. Right? Well, well, which pe- people like Peter Schiff, when they talk about, like they, they're kind of like in the Austrian milieu, but they just like forget subjective theory of value. Yes. I, I have a critique of libertarians actually, where I agree with the subjective theory of value and a lot of Austrian economists in the libertarian sphere say they do, but I don't think they actually do. What is I the subjective that, theory of value? Do you want to, you're, you're probably better at defining this. <laughs> yeah, it's just basically your the price arises from the subjective evaluation of the consumer, not the objective inputs of the product. So, right? so I, I ascribe a certain value of, of this can of zesty beverage and, and I set the price order for that. And it's based it's on subjective my value to the marginal it. utility of your assessment, but that marginal utility is subjective, right? The marginal so, utility being I could choose to spend that money on something else. No, the marginal utility mean? to be is once you've satisfied your thirst, your next can is probably going to value less. Ah, I see. Right? Okay, uh, cool. And so that we have two different observations. One, that diamonds are are not priced the same as water, despite water being more critical for life. Why? Subjective theory of value, 
right? If you're satisfied, if you're in a in the desert, you're going to subjectively evaluate water higher. Mm-hmm. If you're plenty, if you have plenty to drink, and you want to look pretty, uh, you get a diamond, right? And you are willing to spend a lot of money on that, mm-hmm. depending on how wealthy you are. So does that make sense? So like it's yes. that as opposed to the labor theory of value or other theories of value, labor theory of value includes Adam Smith, right? Who believes that the inputs determine the price. But every time economists kind of move that direction towards inputs determining price, we end up basically discovering all kinds of contradictions and problems. Which I think, which my argument here is, I think the Bitcoin maxis have begun to move in that direction greatly. Or that the value of, of uh, work is what determines the price. Yeah, and, 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 and what I and what I mean by Bitcoin maxis is there is a cult that exists within the crypto sphere uh, called Bitcoin maximalism, and it's Bitcoin over anything, BTC in particular. Um, and there's, they're just kind of assholes. <laughs> like, like yeah. that, that is kind of and, and everybody canceled, everybody reckon. I don't care. I agree that. with him. Um, I agree. But but like it. And it doesn't go to say like I like I still think Bitcoin's valuable. It's just like there's this cult that exists around it that is um, makes it really hard to be in that space. And frankly, they've driven all of the good developers out. All the good developers have exited and moved to Ethereum and are building on top of Ethereum um, or or other chains like Solana or something. Or, BSV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Exactly. Well, I, so uh, the uh, and the and the difference here being stake right gives you voting stake in the coin right yes. about how much you own stake right? being yeah i own proof x of amount stake. but, but of you, coins. you are actually proof of work where proof of work is your computer runs uh an algorithm and solves math problems to validate the 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 blockchain as your mechanism for guaranteeing security and then having stake in the network right? yes yeah, so, so like what i do is i accumulate a bunch of coins onto blockchains that I care about. And frankly, a lot of a lot of people, this is kind of like we meme about the pudgy penguin thing, but pudgy penguins at, in large, people that tend to own them are tend to be very crypto native individuals that have a lot of culture built around them. And because they're so crypto native, you have people that are building very valuable technologies going to the penguins and dropping uh, coins to them on their Genesis block. So when the when the chain is made. So you have on Ethereum, there's a thing called ZK rollups. ZK rollups are zero knowledge rollups. They're essentially like rolled up blockchains so that you can like export project data onto and it clears things up and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get all into that. But you have places where those chains are essentially built and funded in the beginning. And so I have a bunch of investments on the platform where those are going to be getting built up. And I get... and everybody that's in the pudgy penguin community, essentially, if we, if you were an active participant, um, we got airdropped about like 8% of the coins for the initial Genesis block. And then what most of us did about 80% of us did, we staked in it and now we have voting. So you have like this 8% block of, of purchasing power that exists here on the chain that are voting on the governance pro- proposals for the direction that the chain goes because it's a decentralized system. Right. So people can submit proposals to it and we get to vote and people actually are actually coming to us and like being like, hey, we want, you know, like this is what we're trying to make. And, and they're coming and trying to educate us on what they're doing and stuff. So it's like this very decentralized kind of hive mind process. Right. That exists. You keep using the word decentralized, but I'm curious, aren't you just part of like the central, like the board of directors at having voting power in that way as an owner of it? I mean, isn't that what miners are? I mean, I, I suppose. I, I think that the definition of that's different depending on. I mean, the I mean it's decentralized I, I mean, as, as as opposed to going to the state of Delaware, organizing a corporation using the state to organize the hierarchy of your corporation. Sure, right? it's bottom up. It's, yeah. it's 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 a it's a different way to think about an organizational structure because it's online, digital decentralized yeah because i mean like in in proof of work it, everything's just minor consensus right um i mean it's, it's the same type of process is it purely you're never going to have like a pure this is why the the decentralized term is very ambiguous but i mean you have countless amounts of people that can participate in this process on a on both proof of work or proof of stake side but it's and still- actually what i think is the way that you should look at it is i i, I am a 
polytheist when it comes to my coins or when it comes to crypto. I don't believe in any like this is the one, this is the one. I think different coins should serve different functions. And I think that you should have a mixture of different types of uh, consensus mechanisms. So like some coins should be proof of work, some coins should be proof of stake. And I think it's much more about the industry as a whole that matters. Um, and that's true decentralization, especially as the chains are becoming more interoperable and they're connecting into, to, to, to everything. Like you have side chains plugging in. Frankly, I think Bitcoin's eventually going to be a side chain of Ethereum. <laughs> that, that, that's what I think the future is. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's controlled by Ethereum. Well, there was that hack a while ago uh, where, uh, what was it, like 200 and some million dollars worth of Ethereum were ha like stolen in a hack. And then Vitalik was basically able to just switch it back. You remember that? When did that happen? Was is that? Are you talking the DAO hack? Uh, I'm not sure. I can look up the exact date, but uh, it was very. I mean, pretty yeah. prominent. Because any most times when people say a hack occurred, it, it always ends up being one of these things where you're like, oh well, it's not like. It, 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 it's never usually exactly like that simple. <laughs> it's not usually, it's not a hacker man, right? It's yeah. not a guy with a VR headset, like flying through the, the internet. But cause like that type of stuff is something that ha would happen on like Solana or something. Yes. The, so, the devs have like, it's very centralized, very central control. Yes. It would be the Dow hack. $60 million hack in 2016 led to a controversial revision of the blockchain and was a factor in leading to the ICO boom starting the following year. Blah, Consensus blah, blah. mechanisms are very different now from what, what they were then though. Like the the chain was more e was more centralized than where now it is very decentralized. Although you would say, and this would be the argument that the BSVers would make of Bitcoin core, right? Is like you basically have all the developers in kind of like its own system and the Ethereum foundation does have a lot of power over the future. Precisely. But, but when you have things like EIP 1559 or whatever it was, which is kind of rechanged the structure, like Ethereum is now a deflationary asset. There's now a burning that happens with gas fees. So like you actually have the supply is actually going down right now. But that was that was a major contention where you basically had like the Ethereum foundation versus the miners at the time, because it, that's also what switched uh, Ethereum from proof of work to proof of stake. Right. So there was a massive fork that occurred, right? And as a BS viewer, you're all familiar with uh, forks. <laughs> yeah. right? But it, it also in that that the biggest case for proof of stake at that time that I understood was to save on energy. It had everything to do with the climate cult. It had, yeah. it had almost nothing to do with like this is better for crypto. Climate or this cult's is a very for, big like, deal with the uh, with the variables of. of Here, all here's of that, the right? other problem with proof of stake too is if you're just a very uh well funded outfit individual organization whatever you can just buy a ton of that you can also coin. buy asics though you could right <laughs> well you can buy a ton of that asset and then you can have a a disproportionate share of the voting rights of that of that chain i mean yeah i suppose you could uh, you know you could uh yeah buy a lot of computational power and become a, a competitive miner that's on that's, a, on that's a, how on dash was created wasn't it dash coin was created out of bitcoin by one dude who bought a who basically started his own node started his own mining company and then separated out so he could create the good digital currency that would be adopted it was yeah. an entrepreneurial venture sure yeah. yeah and he forked his own version of bitcoin out of it yeah well, I mean, I, but I, to me, that doesn't seem terribly decentralized. I mean, it could it could certainly be, uh, you know, the, the direction of the chain could be manipulated by someone who wanted to buy in. The, the thing about BSV is that the protocol is locked that it will never change. There's not a, a core developer group. There's not a, you know, any sort of ownership or a social democracy around what direction it goes. It just is what it is. Well, and you can just build on it and you can create your own products that utilize it. Remember so I said, I'm polytheistic. I think all these different chains should have different rules. Sure. And that's like, fine. Like I, I'm very much like, I like I'm very libertarian on this uh, and, and very subjective theory of value here. We're like, I don't think that there should be a single chain that everybody's just looking at. I yeah, think that you should be diverse across the industry. For sure. And I think things are going to be bridging. And I think they're on the, on the UI, UX, you, uh, UI, uh, UX kind of user experience side of things. I think the average person is not even going, is eventually going to be at a point where for most of their crypto experience, they're not going to realize what chains they're on. Mm -hmm. I, I, we're not there yet, but I think within the next 10 years, I think that will be how most people interact with crypto. And I think most people will be act, interacting with crypto. I think so too. Um, like that. And, but then you'll have it be like, oh, I'm going to own Bitcoin and that's like my digital gold. Or I'm going to have like this cash, I'm going to be using this cash system and it's, that's basically going to be like my new credit card, Visa card. I'm going to be using borrowing and lending protocols through like Aave. Um, 
which is great. Like so many people that don't exist in the system is like you, we are at the point where you can be your own bank, like, and you can be borrowing and lending like you would have with a bank right now. We are at that point right now. And I do it actively and it's incredible. I've been doing it for years actively, f- four years. And it's great. Like it's, it's incredible to be honest. Like it's, it's a very beautiful technology that, um, allows you to actually have freedom. Mm. So um, go on to Coinbase and buy some BSV. No, I'm kidding. Fuck no. I'm getting no, was, First of all, that's impossible. <laughs> I, that's the joke. I'm joking. <laughs> but I was, it's not financial advice. And yeah. How long have we been going? We don't have our clock up. Like Hour usual. 45. All right. Guys, I well, think that's a really good place to wrap. It was great. Thank yeah. you. Well, not, not, not financial advice. Not financial advice. Do your own research. Yada, yada, yada. I would say my critique of a lot of the people in the Bitcoin and Bitcoin derivative space is that they're not actually interacting with the technology as it exists now. That 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 would actually be my my critique of We're going to do a realm. members exclusive with Kyle where he's just going to tell you how to be a, a where he's going to give financial advice. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin millionaire. Um, um, one quick beautiful. thing, Dave, you were actually pretty close with the Haitian graper. Uh, it was Boston, not New York or Texas. Oh, he immigrated from Texas, but it was Boston. Uh, my bad. My okay. home. It is North yeah, I'm sorry, you buddy. would just soil the name of Texans. Like how that. could I? <laughs> well, yeah, just soil my home state. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're Montana now, buddy. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Appreciate it. See, See you guys. Ya. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Human Reaction. Help us fight internet censorship by liking, commenting, subscribing, following, and sharing the show with your friends. To find us around the internet, visit linktree.com slash human reaction pod. And remember... She's fading yeah, into the distance par- anyway. <laughs> yeah, so this is a metaphor. She, she's it's wearing a metaphor. a metaphor for her political campaign for president. She's fading into the background.